really good. Mm. <laughs> and when we get to start then, we're also checking in glacial erratics. And hopefully, right, who watched this Alice Roberts thing? You did, right? No, I'm, no, I'm not. I recorded it. I went to can't send it. <laughs> Out. Delete it. When I've done my bit about glacial erratics, I want you to do a comparison. Okay. okay. So, uh, right, the significance of this, I'll be back in a sec. Do you think it's for making good curry? Probably, yeah. <laughs> I'd suggest you ask them. Yeah. Never know how they go. You'll we'll keep quiet. <laughs> It's a hat. It'll go down to six o'clock in the morning. Yeah. Yeah. They got it the wrong way up. Well, you can put yeah. everything in it. It's like an astrophysicist. <laughs> yeah, it's been worse. Yeah, we have to know if there's residue or something. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Might leak a bit. Right, and one quick thing, right? It's your fault, Kathy, right? I have got loads of tops like this, and I was wondering if anyone's got any black dye because it's really expensive stuff to buy these days. Yeah. Those little sashes, black dye. It's navy blue. You got a hole in it. I want to dye in black. I got, I got, I got three of these. Well, then you'll, it'll go all over the. the no, it won't. Well, oh, anyway, um, significance of this, what does this tell us, Chris? That they had wheat. <laughs> yeah, and something else? So that's, um, they were collecting food. Yeah, they were collecting food and anything else? Well, was there any residue in um, it? Yeah, that's the whole point. We're starting to look at these artifacts um, for residual data, which, which we come across uh, the other week. Um, so today we're going to be looking at... Um, uh, terra preta, um, which is the idea of black earth. We'll, we'll, we'll mention what that's about in a short while. Uh, we're mentioning icon wheat and emma wheat. We're mentioning glacial erratics. Um, and we're just going into something that maybe Alice Roberts has done, i.e. Um, in the Mesolithic period, there's a lot more going on um, than we give the uh, period credit for. In fact, the Mesolithic period is wholly fascinating. Um, and it's based around the idea that um, when you come into the Neolithic period, you've got the term Neolithic revolution. In fact, it's not a revolution at all because that's already occurred. Um, like many things in history, there, there's a build up. Um, if you look at the metaphor of Waterloo, there was a huge build up to Waterloo before it happened. There was a huge build up. Um, to Napoleon and Wellington. It wasn't just um, the beginning and end of something, it was the build-up. All these things in history are a build-up. The end of the Roman Empire occurred because there was a build-up to it. And, and all these things um, uh, are, are the final um, chapters. So when we say the, the Neolithic Revolution, that's the final word in it. That's the final chapter, and now we're in a new period. That's what the word Neolithic means the new period, the new age, because everything, this is a good start, has already happened. And the idea of storing things, the idea of keeping things, means, means that you've got excess as a society. Um, it, it's an also an indicator of where you're going to go next. Where you're going to go next, because you carry something. All these link in very nicely. So next, uh, we've missed a slide. Now, I didn't want to use this slide oh. because, yes, well, um, there's a seal being clubbed to death. This is the typical image of Mesolithic life that we would wish to find when we were looking at the Mesolithic period from 10,000 years ago. But if you take, this, this slide is actually in two parts. There's the clubbing bit and everything on the other side. And the other side is where you understand the period. They're, they're eating loads of different things. Um, and there's contrasts. There's contrast between soft and hard. Soft is in wood and flesh and all the rest of it and grasses and so on to hard stone and what you're going to do with that stone. There's also the contrast between eating meat and then suddenly 
not eating meat. They chose not to eat meat. Because einkorn, you can make into other things instead of eating meat. Um, and maybe the reason why people are turning from meat to eating vegetables and eating berries and eating grain um, is very much to do um, with what with the reason why people turn into vegetarians today. It's not just about the brutality of how we keep animals. There's lots of reasons. And there's lots of reasons why people are changing in the past. Okay, that's ridiculous for me to say they suddenly turned into vegetarians, but the point is they're one minute eating meat and the next minute they're eating loads of vegetables and a little bit of meat. So, you know, that's the huge, there's lots of changes. And this is all leading up to 6,000 years ago, leading up to that start of the Neolithic period, the new age. Um, whenever we are now in a new age, because we use computers, but they were using computers in the Second World War. Uh, it's just that now everyone's using computers, except for Keith. Isn't it strange they're plugging seals in? We're still doing it. Um, but not for food. I, 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 I'm going to agree with you completely there. Um, but I'm also going to say um, they were also clubbing seals, um, not just for food in the past as well. They... they but today we're doing it for a very different reason. We're doing it for, uh, for, for fun. We're doing it for sports. We're doing it for scientific reasons. Uh, but there were also other reasons in the past why they're clubbing to death the seal. But I think that's a really uh, good, re that's a really, really good statement. You know, um, nothing has really changed. In fact, humanity in lots of areas hasn't really changed. Um, but one thing is very important, these things. Now, whenever I've looked at boulder woodlands, uh, I struggled to put across um, what these things are really about. And if I had a, a nice little chart, um, and a nice whiteboard, and a nice pen, and there it is over there, If somebody's got a little bit of a wet wipe, we can sort of rub that off, I think. Any of you remember what that was? It's very old, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna have a little bit of a chart today. Uh, a nice bit of a... And anyone who's nice to me gets an archaeology company pen today. I could do with some more. No, you're not having one because you're annoying. <laughs> um, and you know what? I don't believe it. It's, oh, it's the children again. They picked on my bloody whiteboard pen. Anyway. 87% of the seals in Pembrokeshire, the crops have been chilled this year. 87%? What? 87%. Why is that? In the storms, they had really nice storms. Oh, it wasn't because of uh, goths going out there clubbing, yeah. was it? They're all over the beach, Dennis. Yeah, thanks for that, Jane. Sorry. You know, next time, can you just not turn up? Uh, she won't next week. No, I can't. Can't can you? <coughs> right, okay. Um, whiteboard. Jane, and you can hold that. <coughs> if you don't want, I need to take her off, right? To make you feel useful and part of the group. Um, so, boulders. Um, there's a place known as Harwood. Uh, which is just near Bridgend, and it's a very strange place where you get loads of bald boulders in a in a triangular field, right? Everywhere else there's no boulders, triangular field, and there's loads of sycamores growing up in amongst them. Um, and you're thinking, out of all the places, this area has still got those boulders, which is really strange. Um, and why is it strange that you get some parts of the British landscape in the area where the glaciation was? And I've got to make sure I don't hit you, Gillian. Because you will have me on that one. Um, in, in, why is it in areas where there's a glacial landscape, or there used to be, do you find no boulders, and over there you find some boulders? There's reasons for all of which we'll come into. Um, now, lots of these great huge boulders will be found in upland areas. Um, places such as the Snowdonian landscape, but very, very few. One or two places in Anglesey. Uh, one or two places up in North Wales. Don't worry, Jen, I'm not really worried about you. Uh, uh, places like Yorkshire, places like Cornwall, um, you get these boulders. And what's really happening is this. Uh, our, hum our human ancestors, um, 12,000 years ago, 
Uh, I see in suddenly the landscape becoming full of trees. We've done all the cave stuff. We don't really need to go there. Um, leading up to about 10,000 years ago, we can probably say that uh, most of Britain is covered in trees in most areas, even flat home and steep home. Places like Snowdonia are covered in trees, basically. Okay, it's really warm. Temperature is warming and temperature is different from, it is, from where it is today. Uh, and what, what's happening in no particular order, um, our, our, our ancestors are clearing the landscape. Um, and what they're finding in amongst the landscape are these boulders absolutely everywhere. Um, except for parts of southern England. What's happening is, is the as the ice is melting slowly across the landscape, it's retreating 12,000 12, years ago, slowly retreating into Scotland and further along. It's just dropping these boulders. And what's simply happening uh, is the effect that, that boulders are being sort of um, pushed on by the ice and then they're being recycled and they're being brought all the way up and they're being dropped back down again. It's like um, a conveyor belt. These boulders, some are 10,000 tons in weight. Okay, these are huge things. But they're moving everything along that is just recycling them. And there's another point there as well. It's a complete digression here. Uh, there's another point. Um, if you've got human activity um, 14, 15,000 years ago on those wonderful landscapes, as the ice is moving forward, it's removing everything. All evidence is being removed. Um, some people believe that we've got an advanced civilization that was on this planet, uh, you know, with computers and all the rest of it and so on, and the ice has come along and erased it all, you know, and that they're saying, oh yeah, it's quite possible that early civilizations that were advanced as that was right were completely wiped out by the ice. They weren't, okay? But what we're talking about, we're talking about basic civilization is being completely removed other than the stuff in the caves, and we've found that the caves are really, really interesting places to find evidence. That's where um, that's the, those are the only places where you find them. Um, and then occasionally where, where ice is suddenly melting just like that, big boulders are just dumped across the landscape forming huge moraines, huge barriers of huge rock. Um, and I believe, and some others believe, that in one of those places in the country where you see suddenly there's um, the ice melts and all the boulders are dropped in one place, it's Stonehenge. Um, it's quite strange that lots of the stone in Stonehenge is nicely smoothed and all the rest of it. We're going to go with the Priscelli still. There's a massive debate there and it's got really nasty. Um, but lots of the stones um, on the Salisbury Plain, the Sarsen stones have been moved there by glaciation. Okay? Blue stone, yes, and some other stones have got there by glaciation. Suddenly there's a moraine drop. And you can imagine. Um, um, we in the past have wandered across the landscape, we're clearing it, we find these boulders here and there, and suddenly we find a load of them in one place. That must be really special. And that's really what we're talking about. Um, so what's happening, um, say about uh, 10,000 years ago, we're talking about clearances of the landscape. Um, leading up to, say, 6,000 years ago, uh, we get not only clearances of all the trees, but we get the boulders being moved around as well. Evidence, Stonehenge. Evidence, all those places where you get standing stones. Um, and that's going on up until about 5,000 years ago. So Penjain, okay, so what we're talking about um, is between about 10,000 years ago and maybe 6,000 years ago. What's happening is that you've got tree clearance um, and in amongst um, what's left of that landscape, you've got the boulders, people are planting in amongst the boulders. And then sometime around 6,000 years ago, we get a new period known as the Neolithic. Um, large numbers of these boulders are being moved to create boundaries. Well, it's in the archaeology. We can't deny it. It's there. And they're creating places like Avery, Stonehenge, and all the rest of it. All these places are being constructed using these boulders. It's fact. Don't need to argue with that. Wherever the stones are coming from. Um, and then... About six, between that period then and about 3,500 years ago, um, between 6,000 and 3,500 years ago, um, they're really starting to clear all the boulders across the landscape. But there's some upland areas where they've moved the trees, these upland areas, where they haven't exactly moved the boulders yet. They moved all the trees, they've done the agriculture, but they haven't moved all the boulders yet. I've got one example to show you. 
this place called, uh, called Castle Rig in Cumbria. Um, and they haven't moved all the boulders yet, and suddenly we have a, we have a climatic collapse, and in those upland areas, um, the, the, the temperature drops so rapidly, the nutrients are washed out of the soil so much that agriculture can never occur there again. There's no point going there. There's no point in moving these boulders, and that's why these boulders are still there today. Cornwall's a really good example. Those that have been with me to Cornwall, they will see that. And this is why these boulders are so important. Oh, there's my will. Oh, God. Right, okay. Um, yes, I, I've, been, I've been instructed by, by my family to do a will recently. <laughs> Yeah. My eldest son has told me I've got to do it. Michelle said I've got to do it, and my parents are saying I've got to do it. Is there something that can happen? Definitely. definitely. Yeah, definitely. Good, 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 good. Uh, but Kathy's in on this as well. She wants a copy. Um, you can see something interesting here. Um, again, the, the, this is the type of um, Yorkshire landscape as well, where You've got all the trees removed. Um, the landscape isn't really brilliant for ploughing anymore. You can graze sheep up there and so on. Can't really plough it. Nutrients have been washed out the soil. Boulders still dotting the landscape. You can see that they've used some of the boulders to um, construct the walls, but we're still in this period uh, of the Mesolithic. So I've gone way forward. Let's get back to the Mesolithic. And let's try to understand, not my will, um, what these boulders <coughs> mean. Now, you're, you're a Mesolithic person, um, and we're back to uh, this period here. Um, that's our wonderful Mesolithic period there, okay, from 12,000 uh, years ago. But, you know, there we go. This is the period you're talking about, um, the core of the Mesolithic. And you're clearing on these trees, and, and it's the idea that um, we may have actually felt these things as being very special. We're not sure where they came from, and eventually they were felt to be special, and they were moved. Um, and I haven't said for one minute that they started moving the stones just 6,000 years ago in the Neolithic. Uh, these stones are gradually being moved. They're gradually being shifted in some areas over uh, 4,000 years. It's no surprise that you've got a wonderful flat Salisbury plain because all those stones have been moved over a long period of time. People have been moving them to the edges, breaking up, 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 shifting them. Some of these boulders, we've got one or two rare examples in Great Britain. Some of these boulders uh, were 1,000, 10,000 um, uh, tons in weight. Um, and they were just broken up bit by bit, broken up bit by bit, chipped away, and then eventually um, those boulders no longer cease to be there. But... Oh God, I don't want to do this, but um, in, the, in this period of the Neolithic here, what we do find is that the rare boulders that are left on the landscape, um, our ancestors are doing something else. Um, they're actually um, dying. Um, they're, they're, they're undermining um, these boulders. So what they're doing, they're, um, so if we take this one, this is a small boulder, small example, um, probably about... Um, 20 tons if that's granite and what they're doing uh, they're undermining it a little, little bit and putting a boulder underneath it uh, they're undermining it this side putting a boulder underneath it about a meter they're undermining it that side putting a boulder underneath it undermining it that side putting a boulder underneath it doing a couple here and there and it almost looks as if it's being supported by these little boulders and we have done it as human beings we haven't actually moved that at all Okay, um, and that might be an archaeology can be project in the near future. Um, I'm not. I'm just going to be supervising it. Um, just checking out <laughs> the boulders underneath. I mean, it's a, if there's a little bit of give, okay, I'll just ignore that they were ever there. I think that's a, what the a plan my family have got for me. But these boulders are really important, and you can see it start to see that in the Mesolithic period. Again, looking at this landscape, remember at one stage there were loads of trees growing here. <coughs> um, and you can see in the lower areas, that's where all the boulders have been moved to create these walls over a long period of time. But these, these slightly upper areas, banded landscapes, they can't really do agriculture up here anymore, can't really move these boulders. But when you start to look at these, lots of these look as if they've been chipped and cut into. Um, somebody has um, attempted to break up these stones. 
Kathy went up to me, come up with me to Brown Willie um, in Cornwall. Uh, and at Brown Willie, uh, you've got a weird, um, um, you've got, um, if you remember it, Kathy, it was like a few stones like this, a few stones like this, and a big stone on top. Yeah, a uh, bit of a landscape there, and it was known as Brown Willie, um, and that's in Cornwall. Uh, and that's that's a geological feature, but it's probably been it's probably been aided that way at, at times because uh, they they've been chipping away at it. They, they've been bits have been falling off naturally and all the rest of it. You can see in the fields down below, not here because this is North, North Yorkshire, but similarly, you can see in the field down below by Brown Willie that um, they're, they're actually making buildings out of all the boulders across the landscape. So what have we done? We've gone, we we'll go back to the beginning again. You've got woodland, no real need to muck around with stone. But when all the uh, wood's gone, you've got to start mucking around um, with the new relationship that you've got with stone. Okay, the next best thing. Um, oh, this is sort of on its side, um, but this is actually uh, not in Great Britain. Uh, this is an example of a boulder, upside down. That's an example of a boulder um, known as the Madison boulder um, in um, New Hampshire um, in the good US of A. Um, and if you, if you follow the cursor, that's probably the height of where somebody would stand. Uh, I do believe that this has been estimated to be up to about 15 tons, uh, 15,000 tons in weight. 15,000. This isn't just stone that you find out there, these buildings. This is stone that's been compacted together. This is um, igneous and metamorphic rocks that have been heated up and it, it's just full of so many minerals. There's no little gaps there and that's why it's so heavy. Uh, and some of those boulders did exist in this country one, once, but they've all been broken up. Um, and utilized. Um, and that's sort of what we're talking about. We, we're talking about, um, it, it's it's a difficult concept to believe that, that ice actually moved that, and certainly at one point the ice moved it up there, moved it up there. Maybe this was taken up to a mile above the landscape, and then as it started to melt, made its way through to be nicely dumped where it is. It could have fallen to stand like a soldier. It could have it could have actually stood upright rather than on the flat. But that would be natural. But can you imagine what our what our ancestors would have felt of that? Oh my God! What what is that? Is it a god? Um, is it um, what is this? It's just sat sat on the earth. There's no other stone around. What is this thing? Don't chuck in the god thing there. Um, but um, you know. Th these things, these things are really important. And, and um, okay, Jane, you're walking hand in hand with your lovable husband, and you come across this. And what do you say? Wow. Exactly. <laughs> and and what would your husband say that this could be? Uh, How did it get there? It's so big. I think. I think. We probably, with what we know about you know things nowadays, yeah. we'd say straight away that it was um, a glacial remains. And but you don't know about glaciers in the past. Yeah, no, in the past, no, ten thousand years ago, what do you feel? Yeah. It's something to worship, definitely. Okay, well, that, that would have just chucked out in there straight away. Would you agree with that, Julian? Worship. Yeah. Possibly. Okay, something unusual. That's what I wanted. Well, no, not good. They made the uh, the little mountain in. Oh, the, oh my God! Yeah, we're gonna do. Um, I, I, I wanna, I wanna do that in a minute if we can get it up here. Um, the uh, dwarvy. Hang on, if we can put it up there. Dwarvy stain. Hoy. Now, Kathy has added something really, really useful there, and I think we might be able to get that. Basically, the dwarvy stone is is a glacial stone. Um, and they've actually carved a year ago. Well done, Kathy. Uh, they, they've carved a tomb into it. Oh, this, this, is, this is actually on the island of Hoy. The weird thing is, is the island of Hoy, um, as part of the Orkney Ar Archipelago of Islands, um, <clears throat> has got so little archaeology on it that you sit back and you think, but where is it all? Okay. 
Um, and it's hidden out there. Um, if you start to look, but it was such a barren landscape, few archaeologists have been there to really study it. Uh, but this is in a bit of a valley, okay, it's known as the Dwarfy Stone, and you go in there, right, and going down back there, all the stone has been carved out. Um, don't know why you're cold, you sat next door to the radiator. Uh, I haven't picked on you yet, so you're lucky. Um, here, all right then. Uh, yeah, I heard about that, yeah, we don't go there. And this is carved out in here. It's a glacial erratic that's been carved out. So, you know, it, and okay, they say it was a, a burial chamber and all the rest of it. But I tell you what, um, it's really dry in there, isn't it, Kathy? Because it's solid rock. You, you could quite happily live in there. Um, you wouldn't have any health problems. Um, and going back to something that I used to say when I was a child, okay? I used to say, why is it our ancestors used to live in places um, that were, you know, the burial chambers and all the rest of it? I used to think this when I was, when I was a child, 43 years ago or whatever, uh, 33 years ago. I used to think, look at these burial chambers and all the rest of it. I used to think, <laughs> health and safety. He's definitely enough to get in here today. <laughs> um, I used to think, these things are so wonderfully built, why didn't they live in them, right? Why did they live in hovels and all the rest of it? I used to think that when I was a child, and years later, archaeologists start to think, oh, actually, they weren't, they didn't start off to be burial chambers. And you start to think, oh, I was right all those years ago. Well, that's what. Oh, <laughs> 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 uh, no! She bloody did. No! No way! No way! You obviously watched it too, so. Hang on a minute. In my defense, haven't I been saying that for a year? <laughs> Come on! Uh, Come on! Yes, thank you, Lynn. I've been saying that for a year. I told you when I come back from that university lecture that day. Right, Alice Roberts in future, out. <laughs> right, when I see her next, right, I'm going to give her a hug. <laughs> uh, look at that! Oh, that is actually in the good old UK. That's the um, uh, border stone in Borrowdale. Um, and you can just imagine that um, you haven't got a stone upright or flat, you've got it slightly like that, and you're thinking, you know, if, if you've got, if you've got, um, if you're thinking about building stone circles and all the rest of it, you're probably looking at it and thinking, how the hell do I replicate that? How, how do I make something like that? That must have been done by a god who's able to do that, because there, there's. You can see through that bit there, you can see through that, it's a bit of an angle. Um, no, those steps are not supporting it. Um, I have no idea of the tonnage on these, but you can get an idea, it's in the thousands of tons. It's a really heavy piece of stone. Um, and it's one of those people, that pe one of those places that people go to today and think, wow, this is amazing, this is amazing. Hang on a minute, we've got mobile phones, computers, uh, we've got um, sound recording devices, we've got all these different things, and we're thinking this is amazing now. So how would they have felt about this in the past without any of this technology? They must have been overawed by it. It must have been big wow, Jane, massive wow. Um, and whether you're thinking about ritual and gods, um, you can start to think that they, 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 their minds are moving. It's not, it's not a flat in this landscape, um, and it's not as plain and boring um, as archaeologists paint these landscapes to be. You know, my, 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 mind, is, my mind is on that sort of constant, um, when I used to take, take places, people to places five years ago, I used to get a textbook and I used to really struggle if I didn't tell everybody their fact, the facts in this book now. I turn up to these places now and I just give it as it is. And that's far more interesting because most of these facts in these books are now turning out to be wrong, aren't they, Alice Roberts? Expert professor. Why didn't you just take over and you two can do this lecture, Alice Roberts, and tell us all what happened? Prior to be becoming a father in later life. Cool. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Jane, do you fancy going out for a drink and just leaving these two? Um, you can come with us if you want, Keith. Oh, fish and chips. Yeah, that's good. Um, this, this itself, as you all know, is that wonderful site at Stonehenge. 
as controversial today as it was when it was constructed. Now, we're not going to zoom in on any of these stones, probably for a reason, because we all know what they look like. They're all smooth. And archaeologists have said that somebody spent hours smoothing these stones, rubbing up against them and all the rest of it. And so, but lots of these stones are really smooth at lots of sites. It's not a phenomenon just for stone hands. Um, and uh, all the, the wonderful um, carpentry, carpentry um, you know, you've got mortise and tenon joints. You've got, uh, this is tongue and, ju tongue and groove. Uh, you've got little eyes here. So that the stones could, you've got the mortise and tenon idea of construction. And they said that obviously the people building these were just full of their carpentry skills. Uh, that's a book anyway. Uh, but if you, if you look at this, uh, they're naturally smooth. And this reason why they're naturally smooth, because that's how they were found. I don't know if any of you have ever been um, in a dark, dull field with me, in an isolated part of the landscape by pile, dragging you across a field and showing you a standing stone. Ever been to that one near pile? Well, in pile, there's, there's, there's if you, if you're a, a passenger um, and you're able to sort of, as you, um, which way do we drive on the road here? Oh right, yeah. Um, so if you. <laughs> Don't worry, uh, Keith, you're safe from me. Uh, so if you're a passenger in the back of the car, um, coming back from Swansea and you're looking over on the left, pile away, there's a massive boulder in the field, just there. It's huge, big boulder. Um, it's, it's all of about um, 35 tonnes in weight. Okay, huge thing. Maybe a lot more than that, I'm not sure. But anyway, there's a huge boulder there. And it's all smooth, it's beautiful, and this part of it looks like it's sort of... Uh, being, being shaped as if it, it's bark, right? It's a really nice stone there. Lots of it is smooth. That's been naturally dumped there as well. And why it was left there, we don't know. That's the thing. That is the thing. This is this is this is that great enigma. Okay. Um, here we go. This room's full of uh, wine bottles, right? There's a hundred wine bottles in the room, right? Every single one is gone, except that one. That remains. And people coming into the room, they're saying, no. oh God, there's a wine bottle there. And we're all saying, don't touch it. That's a special bottle of wine. Okay. That's what we're talking about with these boulders in the past. Why is it one or two of these boulders are left and all the rest are removed? They happen to be left. Why is that? And, and there's some significance against uh, about that. Like the dwarfy stone, there's one boulder left and they shape it out and they... They live in it, or and then they eventually bury somebody in there. Okay, um, and this is the thing. The, these, this all starts back these thousands of years ago, <coughs> just before I killed Jane. Okay, this whole idea about the significance of these stones goes all the way back. They are important, and they're left. They're not left by the Mesolithic people to be there. Uh, start again, they're not left by the Neolithic people to be there because they're already there. The Mesolithic people have left them there. The Mesolithic people, 10,000 years ago, as they started seeing these things, thought well, they're important. We'll leave that one there. And as they start to use stone, okay, that stone is left there. Just like Hargrove wood, which is very near us. I haven't got a single image of it because there's none on the internet. Um, I can't get hold of my, my file copies at this minute. But Hargrove wood itself... Um, there's these boulders, and the rest of the landscape is completely straight, they're cleared. But there's just these boulders in this one triangular area. It's really strange. Oh, why are they left there? That's the question. Why? They're not built into anything, okay? But they're just left there. And Stonehenge, this is built because it's built. Um, and the original reason why this was built is the reason that it's long since lost in antiquity. This um, is a place known as Castle Rig. Castle Rig itself is a very strange site. It's sort of way up there, surrounded by a, a, a bowl of a mountain range. Um, and Castle Rig, all the stones themselves, uh, you can see that the curvilin the, 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 they've got a curvature to them. The curvilinear. Um, the, 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 there's, there's knobs and points um, and they're really smooth some are, some are this like this some are like this and all the rest of it um, and these 
uh, uh, the natural collection of boulders uh, that were left on the landscape. And we're going to chuck something else in here as well. Alice Roberts hadn't come up with this one. Um, we're going to chuck something else in here as well. <coughs> Maybe actually one, of the one or two of the stones were never moved. They were just left there. And then the other stones were brought in to join them, to create a circle. Uh, because archaeologists are convinced <coughs> that everything was moved and positioned for a reason, but some of them were already there, and they were never, ever positioned for a reason. They're there as the British troops marched into Damascus in 1917 because they're there. There's no reason for them to be there. Don't, go, don't question that, Keith. I know you want to. <laughs> Good. More, more, more of these uh, wonderful boulders here in the woodlands. Um, and you can see that they are in lots of these upland areas. You can recognise that by the pine trees that you can see there. <clears throat> and now this has moved us into the nice bit of agriculture. So we've done lots of these images, images but I've still got to do lots of my fact files as well which we're going to do. Now, this itself is not an axe for cutting down a tree. Um, this is an ant. Um, this is a plow, a plowshare, or whatever you will. This is for plowing. This is for creating um, a very shallow furrow and a little bit of a ridge. Um, some would say you plant in the furrow. Some would say you plant in the ridge. If you plant in the ridge, um, the water can drain down into the furrow um, and drain away. But different people have different ways of looking at agriculture. But um, this was used to plough those ridge and furrows across this wonderful landscape. Very little to none of this evidence um, from the time when we were using these early ploughs exists in actual physical evidence other than the tools themselves. Um, but, um, go on, mention this, this was in Alan Ro Alice Roberts, I know it was. There was um, a burial chamber excavated on the Salisbury Plain, and underneath they found an agricultural surface. Did she mention that? Oops. Ah, agricultural surface, well, linked to this. That's another, it was a burial chamber, that one. The one. Uh, uh, it Hang on, hang on, you butted in too soon. Before the burial chamber was there, in this one spot, where there's a mound above, right, there was a surface that had been ploughed. That's the one I'm on about. Yes, thank you. Oh, I hate this woman. I really do. I really do. Um, and the evidence that we've got for really ploughing of these things now um, is the usual idea, isn't it, um, that we had um, an oxen, um, with all with all the mechanism, two oxen, one oxen, or whatever you want to want to use, right? Uh, and somebody is behind, uh, and the the plowshare, um, the abs is going into the ground, and you're creating a ridge and a furrow, okay? But that's later on. Initially, you've got somebody with a stick um, and a sharpened piece of flint, and it's being dragged across the landscape. And you've got a shallow ridge and a shallow furrow, and that's enough to be planting your crop. And that's exactly what was going on. And actually, that is all you needed to do. And why, why is that all you needed to do? Is because the landscape that these people are ploughing for the first time is so rich, you don't really need to dig deep. Okay? And the nutrients are there. You don't really need to plough it deep. And that's something else archaeologists miss, Alice Roberts, that you don't need to plough the landscape deep because the landscape is already so rich that little indentation across the landscape with that rich soil, you can grow a nice crop. And in fact, einkorn itself doesn't grow metres high, OK? It grows about 70 centimetres in height. So the chaff itself is, is quite small, OK? <coughs> Um, and it means that less nutrients are needed um, to power the grain being produced in the first place. So you don't really need a deep ridge and furrow. But you need a deeper ridge and furrow later on. That's where the oxen and that's where the um, cows come into it and so on <coughs> and so on. 
and the Preswalski horses, but that's something else. Uh, this is a ploughshare. This is an ads. And this is what's going into the ground. And that's what, what with a bit of a stick along there, and that's what's being dragged across the landscape. And there you go, that sharpened end. This is this is being mounted, um, hafted, and it's being dragged along to create the ridge and furrow. And again, another one. There's loads of them. So, you know, you know, a few years ago, I that that guy that guy came up to me and he and he and he had these boxes, boxes and boxes of all these triangular shaped bits of stone they had found in upland Wales. Um, and I, and I, I basically turned around and said, said um, you know, you've got to keep looking. There might not be anything in these boxes, but, you know, keep looking. And he had trays and trays in the back of his car. It's turning out that maybe some of the things he had in the box were actually the really early answers. And they were crude stone being used to being dragged across the landscape to create that ridge and furrow. I, I, was, um, I was at St. Mary's Well Bay, um, which, is, which is between Sully and Lavernock on the weekend. Um, uh, it didn't go it was perfect right until my daughter decided to wander across the mud and she started sinking in it um, there's me running across the mud and she's crying ah, I'm sinking so I got her out of the mud right and then the wellies were left there so me and my son went to get the wellies and then we got stuck that's well we knew that was good um, but eventually we got out but anyway the point is at St Mary's Well Bay my, my son this, decided to get a piece of the local sandstone and he spent an hour and a half now grinding this and he actually created an edge on a sandstone rock and then um, he wanted to cut down a tree but it just didn't work but that had enough of an edge to be used as an ant itself okay to be dragged across the landscape hafted and that's um, what they would have used and we've got evidence for it um, you only need to do something basic. There you go, more of them, more evidence. Um, and that itself is a really odd object. Um, they're, what they're doing is finding lots of this ev evidence ethnographically and ta to understand how these stones are being used come from um, places in the world that were using... Um, the, the early uh, plowshare mechanism, the really early ads to plow with um, up until about 100, 200 years ago. And in places like Turkey, up until about 30 to 40 years ago. We find that they're mounted um, in a piece of wood. Um, and then you've got a pe a, another piece of wood coming out. And that's your really early crude form um, <coughs> of being able to plow the landscape. That's how you create the original furrows. Just a very narrow um, um, slit across the landscape where you might pl plant your food or you might plant your food in the ridge or whatever. Ethnographically, this is how we're understanding these things. Um, and there was, um, um, I'll tell you another little story that's sort of relevant. Um, um, and a, an archaeological friend of mine years and years ago went to Turkey, right? And he, and he, got, he got out of his car, right? And he saw these things glistening in the field, and they were bits of flint. Um, and uh, he, he was—he thought, "Oh my God, I just don't have time to get permission." Right? So he was wandering across the field. He had a bucket loads of these really nicely shaped flints across the entire field. Um, and then the farmer drove into the field with a bucket, and he says, uh, what, "What are you doing?" And, and he said, "Oh, I'm collecting these beautiful bits of flint." The archaeological artifacts. And the farmer <laughs> proceeded to burst out in laughter. And he said, um, I don't know how, how he said it, but he must have said, look, mate, come over here, I want to show you something. And the archaeologist went, oh, my God, he's going to knock me over the head. And he said, look at that there. There's a big wooden board, right? And there's a little groove there. There's a little groove there. And do you notice it's missing those little sharp things, okay, which are those flints that you've just collected across the field, which are mine which I'm actually going to glue back into place. It was a threshing board just to be dragged across the landscape, okay? And, and that would flatten the landscape, job done. And we learn from these artefacts that are found... Um, harrowing. Harrowing, yes. Why did I say threshing? 
was a threshing. I knew I'd use the wrong word. Harrow. To harrow the landscape. They used it. This board was used and dragged across the landscape to flatten it. And the, he, apparently this guy was still using it about um, 30 to 40 years ago. And these bits of flint had only been sort of napped just a year previous. And they'd all come out because the, the wood had warped. Um, and we, we learn we learn from um, understanding um, um, what's out there, looking at um, modern <coughs> examples uh, from places like the Pacific and places like Turkey. And there you go. These are from the Pacific Islands. Uh, the, these are actually um, very crude, um, very crude ads. Okay, and that, that's basically it. You're only going to get a little. It's only going to be that deep, um, but you're going to be able to plant a crop. And the, these are examples. They're only about um, 200 years old, but these are exactly the same things that were being used in the Mesolithic period, 8,000 years ago in Britain. It's said that some of these Pacific islands were still in the Stone Age uh, when Captain Cook got there, because they didn't need iron. If, if, if you don't need iron, and you haven't got iron, you don't need to use it, you could just carry on with your normal lives. And the other thing as well is, um, this form of agriculture um, has a population control about it. Um, and what isn't obvious by now, if you use more and more advanced equipment, meaning that you've got more and more yield of crop and more and more yield of animals or whatever, it means that you can have more children. Um, and therefore population will get bigger and bigger and bigger until there's a, a climate collapse, which happened in Britain around 3,500 years ago, where population dropped from about one and a half million to about a million overnight because those upland areas couldn't be ploughed anymore. and There was less and less food around. Um, and in those Pacific islands, you don't find um, an island the size of Flatome um, with a thousand people on it. You find an island the size of Flatome in the Pacific with 20, 20, 30 people. And that's how it's always been. A couple of people moving between our islands to keep the uh, blood stock um, going. And that's it. And you can't have any more people moving on, living on it because you can't produce any more food. And it's got it's got. A, but as technology advances, you get more and more people on the planet. And we know that. As my grandmother used to say, we need a good old war to deplete the human population. And, and a terrible thing is when 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 the HIV came out, that's what she was saying about that. She said it's a good thing. Whew. But that was my grandmother. Other than that, she was a lovely woman. She was as nutty as me. She met my husband, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right. Oh, no. All oh, right, move on. Oh, God. Oh, we're rela we could be related, Jane. <laughs> I could, in I fact, be your love child. Yeah, I, I don't know. <laughs> what do you mean? Did you, did you, did you ever remember giving uh, birth to a child and just abandoning it on the street? <laughs> right, I think this has got too much. Right. You can marry. <laughs> right. You're on Georgie Grove. Um, the other thing I wanted us to do, and um, hopefully we're going to be able to get through this, but um, the, um, next week... Um, so we'll look at this quickly. The difference between chert and flint. Uh, which is the chert one and which is the flint one? Goff, anyone? One on the right. Yep. And the, the one on the left is chert. And that there is chert or flint? Chert. Chert, correct. Um, uh, catch me out question. What is this? Odyssey. That's right, it's obsidian. You're good at this, aren't you? And what's this? That's flint. Flint. Uh, he's the expert. Ah, oh, come on. No, we're not going to pick on um, Peter. What's this? Chert or flint? I don't know. I heard of chert. So no, chert, chert, is, chert is a, um, a hardy um, a hardy rock. Um, it's... it's um, it's created in a completely different way than flint, uh, but it's um, it's a fairly hardy rock, and it's it's used if there's an absence of flint, okay? And it can be shaped <coughs> into these forms, and that's chert. 
Um, and that is your einkorn. What, what is what are you saying? What's corn? Einkorn, corn. Uh, einkorn. Um, e i n k o r n. Einkorn. That that's it in its natural form. Okay. And that there, that's it in its natural form. And that there is icon itself. And it's to be found in a place known as Karakadag. Um, and that's Karakadag. It's, it's like one of those things. Karakadag. Do 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 do. Karakadag is there in, in, in Turkey. So if, if you move over a little bit further, it's great, isn't it? Move over a little bit further. You're in Georgia, you got wine. Over by you, you got your icon. So you can have a nice, you can have a nice bit of bread mm. and a nice glass of wine. There you go. Mm. <laughs> exactly. Actually, Goss not come in next week because he didn't win the win the wine. He wanted that to be his. Don't don't worry. If you get if you get friendly with Peter and Dennis, you can have a bit of a drink. And some mushrooms. Mm. What? Well, Dennis's was a mushroom soup. Oh, right, and some mushroom soup, yeah. Well, yeah. Mushroom soup. Yeah. And De Dennis can have his own little raffle where one of you win the collector's medal Manchester United coin. You lot are glazing over now. There's our coin. We're going to have a break after this. Um, and that's moving from, um, you, can, you can see the ears there. That's moving into Bali to bog standard barley there and the difference is um, is that einkorn itself is a lot lot more difficult to separate than it is barley itself so um, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about einkorn in a while um, a little bit about domestication of um, uh, pigs is that a cow? no it's a goat <laughs> Not a cow at all. It's a goat. Um, and obviously moving away uh, from tents covered like this into proper buildings that we get places like Hoik. Um, and, you know, what you've got, you've got a, um, you know, you think about church and you think about Flint and all the rest of it. This, this is, this is um, a toolkit made out of sandstone. Um, and sandstone itself not known for um, materials. To actually sort of cut with or to scrape with, um, but you know, if you shape them in the right way, um, you can use sandstone for similar things, but they don't um, remain sharp after um, one blow. Um, and if you if you look, you know, for example, I, I've been in a situation where I've had a credit card, I've wiped the bottoms of my shoes, and then I've used that credit card to cut cheese to put into bread, and then I've used it to put into a machine. In the past, they were the same. They they used whatever materials was available for whatever purposes. And uh, a collection of sandstone here being used for everything. Um, and I do believe that we can go on to our break now. Yes, we can. Um, any questions? Yeah. You use credit cards to cut your cheese. <laughs> yes. Seriously. Yeah, very. Seriously, yeah. 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 yeah, yeah no, 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 basically. Yeah. yeah, I'll, 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 I'll just scraping the dog shit off. Yeah, you should try not to do that. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Pecans. If you give them a good old clean. Because if you give them a good old clean. Yeah. Are you allowed sharp knives then? Yeah, I was just saying. I don't want to put the No, this is. Right, let's move on. Oh, I was going to put the cat on. Yeah, go on, put the cat on. Go on, go away. <laughs> uh, Jane, I, you and I can talk about this, can't we? Are, are you underweight as well? I have no idea. I've never done it, though. So let, let's, 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 um, actually, actually, I don't, I don't, I don't need this, I don't need this on, now. I don't need this on. Well, it's just sort of that. Mm -hmm. oh, it's, it's not going on. Well, so. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sick of Alice. I'm like, I'm 
digging for the booty. Oh, excellent. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I love it. It's all small frames. Yeah, I feel like it's on the side. So it's about the third of all series, and she does it every year. Yeah, yeah. It digs around the country and we record everything. It's quite hot as well. Mind you, there's one archaeologist whose name should not be mentioned in this room at all. A guy by the name of Mike Parker Pearson. Mm. You just have. You just mentioned it. Uh. <laughs> right, so here we go. Um, a few things about. He's been forced to accept other people's views occasionally more recently, though, hasn't he? Yes, he has. Which one is he? Is he a fat one? Yeah, he, he's the fat one. Yeah, he came out. He was this, 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 this. I think he's a very pleasing. I can't believe shaving their big um, toddler experts are tossers. Blinkworth! Ah, oh, God, gee, he's always just he's fucking lazy and he's always in it, just sitting on diggers or stuff. <laughs> Do you know, if you want to, I, I'd hate to know what he says about me. <laughs> when you go to the progen class, right, just oh, have a go at them, you know, me for whatever. The French do Guy, you know, whatever his name is. Oh, Bagoyer. Yeah. Bagoyer. Yeah. 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 I love myself as well, for God's <laughs> sake. Right, okay. Um, I think there's a party oh. from school anti bit coming out here. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> What's that? Public school? No, no, no. no. no, no. Oh, no, being good. Glacial erratics! The public lecturer is not a public school. No, he's just a it's just a toss, I think. <laughs> no, I want to do 20 minutes before we finish. I've got to go in 10 minutes. Right, glacial erratics. Glacial reatic, uh, erratics themselves. Stand again. It's easy for you to say. Glacial erratics themselves differ from place to place. And I just want to give us a, a little bit of information about these erratics, because we mentioned quite a bit. The word erratics take their name from the Latin word erare, which means to wander. That's not a place in Africa. Uh, and are carried by glacial ice. Hundreds, if not thousands of miles. You get stones from North Wales found in places such as <coughs> Plateau. Um, you know, they, they spread across the landscape. There's one boulder which is 17,000 tons uh, in Alberta in North America. 17,000 tons, which is believed to be a glacial erratic. Geologists identify erratics by studying the rocks surrounding the position. An erratic is simply a stone that cannot be identified from the local surrounds. Um, so obviously blue stones, Stonehenge from hundreds of miles away, uh, they are erratics. So they're out of place. They're out of place. Basically, uh, we, us lot, we're out of place in we, so we're all erratics. Okay, and I've got to take my top off. Oh, God, sorry. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> it's, it's, not not it's a good job, good job you're not recording this. I'm not joking. I'm going to shop. I'm going to warn this. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you what, this is not going well today, is it? It's like comedy, Aaron. There are a lot of those in Alaska. What? <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> they are <laughs> 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 um, they, they are indicators of where the glacial ice actually got to. Um, there are areas in southern England that don't have these glacial erratics simply because um, places like Brighton, places like Kent were not hit by the last extent of the glaciation. However, the um, extent of the glaciation before that, the Anglian glaciation 125,000 years ago, did actually reach Brighton and there's different types of stone within that landscape. Um, it tells you about the ice flow. Um, they can be, um, they can be the, the cause and effect um, of sudden um, rises in temperature where the landscape is dropped with a load of these erratics, as we said, or gradually dropped and littered as the ice is retreating. 
Now, they're, they're fascinating vehicles to be able to understand our ancestors' uh, interaction with the landscape. Um, I could so, say so much more about them, um, but the rocks themselves are responsible for carving out our landscape as much as them being um, vehicles to understand um, the retreat and advance of the glacial sheets. Lots of those uh, valleys out there um, have been ground down by lots of these huge boulders, as well as the ice itself. I've got lots to go through now, so I'm going to go on to something else um, that, that is, is very, very interesting, and hopefully I can get this across um, as quickly as I can. It's known as Terra Preta. Um, Terra Preta um, is the Portuguese stroke Latin word for black soil. You could use Terra Nigra, uh, but Terra Preta means black soil. And simply what that is, uh, is the dark earth soils in places like the Amazon Basin. And why is that important? It's important to try and understand two sets of human populations on the planet, um, two huge contrasting ways of acting and living within our landscape. Now, if we'd have done um, what the Amazonian peoples uh, used to do in their landscape, when they still do in Great Britain, our landscape would be still full of trees. Well, maybe up until about the 1700s, but it'd be a hell of a lot more trees around than there is today. And what Terra Preta is um, as follows. When archaeologists were going to the Amazon Basin 40, 50 years ago, from the West, thinking that the Amazon Basin is like Great Britain and Germany and all the rest of it and bits of North America, what they used to find, as they used to auger, take core samples, they used to find what is called the Terra Preta, the black earth. And in that black earth itself, would be charcoal, bits of pottery, organic um, material, microorganisms, plant residue, animal and human feces, fish, animal bones, and so on and so on. And archaeologists could not work out across the Amazon basin why there are thousands of these archaeological sites. And they used to go away thinking, it's an earlier civilization. It's one of those lost civilizations that used to spread all across the Amazon basin, and now it's gone. And they obviously exhausted the landscape, and thousands and thousands of years later, the trees come up and invaded the landscape and took over. That was what the archaeologists used to say. Except, just around the corner, they would see a little village. And one or two archaeologists weren't as arrogant and up their own that they decided to ask the local people maybe what this earth was. It was only the, when one or two started to ask the local people what Terra Preta was that they, that they actually got the answer. And some of the archaeologists sat down and the, the, the head of the village would turn around and say, actually, um, over there, 10 years ago, before I become head of the village, the old village elder died. And that site itself we had lived it for five years. It was rich. Um, we had plant life. We had flora and fauna. It was a rich landscape. We had everything that we needed. And the elder of the village died. So we abandoned the village, set light to his home with him in it. And we just went off and founded this village. And the archaeologist said, that's really strange. Why did you leave a landscape where you actually had everything? And the elder turned around and he says, well, in about five years time, if I don't die, five years time, I'm going to move the village um, hook, line and sinker somewhere else. I'm going to abandon the rich landscape that we've got here and we're going to start somewhere else. And the archaeologist said, that's absolutely crazy. Why would you do that? And the village elder knew a little bit about the West and he said, um, do you know the land that you come from? Is it full of trees? And the archaeologist said, no. Is it full of wildlife? And the archaeologist said, no. And the village elder said, that's why. That's why we move every five, ten years. Because when we get a, a bounty across the landscape, the Garden of Eden, we just abandon that Garden of Eden and we start again to create a new Garden of Eden. And that's how 
we don't exhaust the landscape. <coughs> That's why many years ago, this is me talking now, in Mesolithic Britain, we exhausted the landscape so much that trees would never ever return. We don't have that rich canopy that places like the Amazon Basin have today. Uh, what I want to do now is move on to this wonderful einkorn wheat. And it's a nice little story associated with this. Um, and this will lead us up to 20 past and then we'll call it a day. So we've got 10 minutes. Can't go yet, Keith. Five minutes. Einkorn wheat. Um, basically known as single grain wheat. Can refer to either the wild species of wheat or the domesticated form. The wild and domesticated forms from that wonderful part of Anatolia, southern Turkey, um, are con considered um, to be the very origins um, of some of the grains that we find today. But they're a unique species. They're domesticated. The cultivated form is similar to the wild, except that the ears stay intact when ripe and the seeds are larger. Basically, um, the wild seed would stand up and it just all fall down. With, with the domesticated form, it would, it would remain um, intact um, as a form of wheat until it's harvested and the, the seeds themselves were, were larger. The domesticated form um, is known as petit à plotre in Fra French or einkorn in German. We use the German form, we don't use the French one. Um, einkorn wheat was one of the first plants to be domesticated and cultivated. I'm glad they said first because we've got our hazelnuts, haven't we? Um, the earliest clear evidence of the domestication of einkorn dates, some believe, back over 30,000 years. Uh, more academic archaeologists believe um, that it's, it's domesticated around 11,000 years ago in a proper agricultural, plowable, plantable form. And it took some time to get to us. Whether, um, we were, whether we had our own domesticated forms, we don't really know. But einkorn itself as a species probably got to us just before the land bridge between Europe um, and Great Britain was lost. But it doesn't mean to say that we weren't harvesting and planting various species because we actually were. It only grows about 70 centimetres tall, but you can actually use the chaff itself uh, in various weaving of that bowl that we've seen at the beginning. Uh, the principal difference between um, wild einkorn and cultivated einkorn is seed dispersal. And obviously the cult cultivated one is the one that we've brought into to this modern day. Over time and through selection, conscious and unconscious, the human preference for intact seed heads created domestic variation, which also has slightly larger kernels than the wild einkorn. In fact, the wild einkorn, you could have actually used it anyway, but you know, if you're, if you're planting it isolated, and there's a certain, um, I, don't know, I don't know how it's pollinated, it's probably pollinated by a little bee or something, um, and all that has an effect with all the different bacteria and all the rest of it, everything changes. Einkorn wheat is one of the earliest cultivated forms of wheat alongside emma wheat. Both species you'll find mentioned in my own book, which you've all got. Um, Hunter-gatherers um, in the Fertile Crescent may have started harvesting einkorn. Some believe, you can have another copy for that, Steve, 30,000 years ago. Um, although gathering from the wild for thousands of years um, may have been something that was happening before that. So, but whilst, whilst we're all still here, and we're going to continue whilst Keith is here. Have you enjoyed this today, Keith? Yes. Good. No. <laughs> see you the door. Bye. 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 It's almost as if our human ancestors um, looked towards grain as being something that could keep them in food longer than they just ate, ate meat. For example, you could use that little um, woven bowl itself 
to store the grain over the winter months. Meat might go off if you don't salt it. Uh, bugs might go into the meat and all the rest of it. But you can actually probably keep grain for a lot longer. Um, and it said, very interestingly enough, um, that the domestication from wild einkorn to um, domestic einkorn may have only, only occurred to domesticate it just 20 years. To domesticate something wild into something that you can plant properly as a crop may have only taken only 20 years. So that has implications for everything. You might be able to domesticate a wild species of animal or a wild species of apple over a very short period of time instead of taking thousands of years. We know that ourselves. The Victorians were great at this, weren't they, of domesticating various wild species within a few years. So we can't think that this process took thousands of years. And maybe if archaeologists looked at the archaeological evidence a little bit more, we might be able to find our own ancestors domesticating certain strains of wild grasses, because that's what we're talking about. It's just a wild grass with a little bit of seed on it, which you grind down. Were they making bread at such an early stage from this? We really, really don't know. Um, maybe they were doing something else um, with the fine powder. They may have been used to dress it, dress their faces up with it. They may have been new, using it in a stew. Uh, they may have been using it to make dumplings. We don't know. OK, uh, that's another argument for another week. And um, now what I want to do now is is just basically um, finish um, on where we actually find this archaeological evidence. Um, and lots of um, lots of archaeologists, and you've mentioned the programs on television, um, and I'm waiting for a piece to come up on, on the computer. In the in the heart uh, of Scotland, south of Edinburgh, so you've obviously got um, from Hadrian's Wall going all the way up to Edinburgh, that sort of heart, the sort of lower Highlands area. Uh, there's a place called Bigger. Okay, what's that? Southern Uplands. Uh, there's a place called Bigger, and Bigger itself is an absolutely fascinating site. And if I can get it up here, and at Bigger, archaeologists have, have, have come across by complete accident, site after site that was occupied as settlements in the Mesolithic period. Suddenly you've got Star Car and Hoik. And suddenly you go to this heart of this weird part of Scotland where it's basically bleak and desolate today. But back then, everything that I said with exhaust in the landscape comes into play at this site known as Bigger. And I've got this document behind me if this if this computer lets me do it. Um, Mesolithic people uh, would have visited most parts of Scotland. Um, and that's basically a so site. I'm probably not going to do much of this at all, but you know, I wasn't meant to. Now, there, there it is, bigger, um, in the frame of Scotland, and they've got all these different sites, can't really see it well, around these sort of little river estuaries. And it, it's a fascinating site, it's placed uh, in South Lan Lanarkshire. Um, and they're, they're coming across another wonderful piece of archaeological evidence. They're thinking, uh, this word chert, we're going to be looking at chert and these other instruments next week. Uh, there's some archaeologists discussing... Um, the very existence, because they've got it later, but the very existence of people quarrying shirt in the Mesolithic period. So all this mining for flint in places uh, like um, Norfolk at Grimes Graves. It is in Norfolk, isn't it? I keep, yeah, Norfolk in Grimes Graves, where we got quarrying 6,000 years ago. Well, they were quarrying shirt thousands of years before that. They had agriculture well before the uh, Neolithic Revolution. All this stuff, houses and all the rest of it. So it, it completely changes everything that we think about this wonderful Mesolithic period. In fact, Alice Roberts maybe have said there are human ancestors and the civilizing effect occurred many thousands of years before the civilizing effect of the Neolithic period. In fact, lots of what we're seeing out there, we've evolved and we have adapted ourselves. Um, that's the landscape today. Look at it. Look at it. It's just like endless um, heathers and long grasses for highland cattle. But then at one point, 
they had the material to actually go quarrying and they, they had the material to have forms of agriculture in this landscape. It was full of trees, but it's completely different. That's the effect that our ancestors had on the landscape. They completely decimated it. Whereas people in the Amazon basin, they respected their landscape. So that's the true contrast of civilizations. So who is civilized? Them in the, those people in the Amazon basin or us. And this information goes on. Um, and it says that um, they've got this, this quarrying, although an important late Mesolithic quarrying site. Um, and they've, you, you notice these, these maps. I'm just going through this quickly. But all these different Mesolithic sites along these rivers. There's just not one or two sites. There's loads of them. So when I turn around to say I can't really mention where any major Mesolithic sites are in this area other than down the Gower. In this area, that's where they are. Then the archaeologists are finding the evidence in areas that we haven't looked. Uh, Julian, let's go out and do some archaeological work. We can either do it in beautiful St. Mary's Well Bay, right, where we're going to find archaeology, or we can go into the cold upland areas of Brecon. Which one would you want to choose to do the work? Not the cold one. Exactly. Archaeologists have been thinking like that for years. Okay, and now we're thinking outside the box, and we're going to places like Bigger. Um, and there's lots of information. They've got, they're starting to get radiocarbon dates. Um, here we go, late Mesolithic period, um, about 6,000 years ago. This is the latest stuff, uh, where they've got hazelwood, charcoal, and they've got the quarry in. This is a bit later, but some, lots of this is actually from much earlier, earlier as well. There's loads of sites. Are they all old quarrying sites where they were getting the stone out? And that's why they... Yeah, you, you've got quarrying sites, you've got the settlements. There's so much here, Cathy. And maybe what I could do is join this bigger site in next week to try and understand it a bit more. Uh, to try and understand, uh, this is um, this is an example of some of the uh, microliths, uh, which which are either shirt uh, or they're flint, small little microliths that we're going to do next week. So it'll be fascinating to actually get into that. Um, and they're saying that when they look across this site, here we go, microliths number in the hundreds here over the field. And no, these are not those microlith types of things found in Turkey because there's no ploughing going on there at this minute. There's no harrowing, okay? There's nothing like that. But this is all, whether these microliths were just being used for hunting or they were being used for harrowing, that's another thing as well is, just because you've got something sharp, it doesn't mean to say, you're killing somebody with it, or you're shooting down a bird. You might just use it for harrowing or something more mundane and basic like that. From that example, from that site in Turkey, we can learn from these examples. So I think what we'll do, um, we're not going to do much more of this because I think we'll do a little bit of it next week um, because there's lots of stuff to get through here. And we'll look at um, the flint and so on next week. And we've got loads of sites there. Um, look, this is the type of landscape it is today. It would have been completely different in the past. Um, and there's um, some of the um, archaeological excavation. Um, one quick thing to remark about this, lots of archaeology is to be found in those good old woodlands. Those forestries and woodlands that cover and protect the archaeology for hundreds of years. Archaeologists have not gone. Where would you like to do, Gillian? Work outside in the beautiful fresh air, right? Or work in a dark, damp forest? Outside. Yeah, typical archaeologist. So we're now starting to look into woodlands and forests for this Mesolithic evidence because outside in that wonderful landscape has been ploughed and churned up over the years. So any Mesolithic evidence is gone. But you look in woodlands, in these areas, uh, in, in Scotland, in the lower highlands or whatever Cathy referred to it as, um, in those areas, that's where archaeologists are finding the data. And that's where we're going to go next week. I think on that note, um, and there you go, an image, bags and bags of microliths. Can you imagine what we'll do? We'll have an archaeological excavation. Every volunteer can go a lot away with a few of the microliths. So therefore, you'd only have that many left. So that, that, that's bad archaeology, but that's in the 1950s. Are there any questions from this today? Because this is a good place to stop, actually. Any questions? I've got to be honest with you, right, uh, this has been extremely entertaining today, uh, by far, um, and um, hopefully we'll have a bit of a repeat next week. Uh, I don't know what Nicola missed out on, um, but uh, yeah, it's good that Nicola's joined us as well. So 
Um, with anyone else joining, I think this this is good for now. Um, but we'll have to start thinking about room arrangements. Um, if there's no more questions, thank you very much for coming today, and I'll see you all next week. And we'll have a good one next week as well. Thank you. <laughs> Julian, okay. we're cancelling it then. Uh, <laughs> okay, well, there'll be more room for the rest of us and more <laughs> seats. There will. Uh, and more raffle prizes. Okay, um, don't forget the meal. Don't forget the meal and stuff. Um, and thank you very much. I'll see you all next week. Thank you. So, how, wait a minute. How many weeks have we got before the meal? Oh, we've got plenty of time. Yeah. And whose is that? Oh, Jane. Jane. Oh, you can put that in your pocket and forget about it. I don't know what that's about. It's my the concert, my my concert at church. Gaudete, Gaudete, Christus, just not us. It's Maria Virgin, Gaudete. Take that. I like that. I, I haven't performed that, that honestly. It? It's a I'll stand up and start singing, so it's pointless me going. No, that's all right. It's both to join. So you're going to keep going here then with the, the tea towels? Oh, you're going to use them all. Are you okay? Oh, he's going to have a fag. He's going to have a fag. the old weed no, no. no. All right, let's just, let's go. just go. Just, just get out of here. Good, 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 good. good. Mm -hmm. Julian, <laughs> I gave you a pen, didn't I? All right, sorry. Goff, are you just stroking off? Yeah. Just stroking off. I will be there now. Just, just, just to walk into the box. I think a large t. Did I say that was that? I think a large t-shirt would be um, just thinner. Would, would yeah, I think it'd be thinner, and it would accompany the um, protrusions. That's what I was going to say. Yeah. Oh, 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 bitch. Bitch. 
Probably the t shirt if it's usual. Because a normal v neck t shirt, I would have had. It's an awkward. To anything, there's an example, nobody wants it. Oh well. I'm thinking if we had a hermaphrodite in the room, then. Yeah. Do you think do you, do you think there'd be much of a take if we delivered leaflets? Um, if you're a hermaphrodite, come along to the archaeology class. I wonder if we'd get any takers. Being very really specific. We should grow up the population in the work now. Wouldn't know. But they might turn up and say that they are one, so that's good. Yes. Well, I've been sick for 10 years, so I might as well be good. You want to be a single. You want these people as couples. They're desperate. They're afraid of being alone. To be honest, I've been divorced twice, and I found that when I was divorced, half the time I wanted to be single. Then. You know, it's fun. Well, women, women are a bit of a gender, yeah. Yes, of course. Yes, the gender is like being married to her. Yeah, yeah. She's she's yeah. 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 The problem is that why do they keep issuing these bloody coins with the Royal Mint with different designs? Because so many people are collecting the things. I mean, the more coins go out of circulation. It's a money maker. It's a bloody. <coughs> yeah, oh, it, it is. One of those, yeah. It is a money maker. Mm-hmm. I, I collect the military money, I do. The D Day one, the Batman one. There'll be many of them, are there? Yeah. Have you come across any um, military style funds? Yeah, I mean, I'll refund you for it, sort of thing. So Not face value. Yeah, I'll give you some. <laughs> <laughs> it's just when people are selling pound coins on eBay for ninety nine pence, including postage. Really? Yeah. yeah. Oh. Why? I don't know. You just I don't do. understand that. You just do. Don't forget Jacob's market the next time. I feel you've like already wound him up. There's a detective keeper door up there. Oh, Graham, he used to work for me. Oh, really? I don't know. Do you want to call me back now? The plot thickens. Oh, Speak to him a minute. Love you. Thank 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 you. Yeah, like, yeah, going, but, oh, I'm going to you up. Yes, it was hard to know. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I do like yeah. pennies. I, 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 I can never find pennies. I've got loads of them around the house. I can never find one. Yeah. Somebody eats the pennies in the house, I'm sure. Yeah. There's a monster in the cupboard that munches all the pennies yeah. and got around. But if you're desperate, you can never find Oh, yeah. And then they suddenly all work. Yeah. Oh, yeah, they don't work, yeah. yeah. I bought a set of these gold or silver pens for my Christmas card. Oh. Can you see the writing? No, you can't with the silver. You've got to sort of tilt it. And they don't work properly. And then the one's scratchy, so it's not pleasant to you. Right. Right, well, I want to see you next week. Hope he does okay. Yeah, if only we knew. Yes, we know what you're dealing with. Oh, I can't tell you anything. You'll have to wait for so and so. The doctors are coming around. I'm thinking, oh, good. I can see the doctors going around the room. Then they disappear. And I said, thought you said the doctors. Ah, yes, well, we've got. That was a set of doctors with a record. Um, yeah. and then your father's with the other side. Uh, oh, she took the card. More sympathizers, I guess. The, uh, mm-hmm. the mm-hmm. You can't get any information. Right. Bye. 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 Oh, I could not get one single answer. And I started phoning at nine. I finished, I gave up at six. Yeah. Oh, I have more left. Did you email them?
when people are glued to their emails these days, I'm mm. trying to get phones. Well, I'm going to find something out this afternoon. Mm. Well, if I don't see you next week, I hope you don't. Oh, thank you. At least Margaret's fine now. She seems to be. I haven't spoken to her. Yeah. She seems to be. She came into the hospital me. with me yeah. Tuesday. Oh, no, and no, then no, 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 has gone. Absolutely. I'm a bit shocked. Long term. Yeah. Yeah. Long memory, you know. Yeah. Yeah. She was oh, fine. Don't drink the wine. Well, she Okay. She looks good, yeah. yeah. She's eating, she's got an interest again. So. Oh, that's good. It's quite interesting the conversation but between the two of them because they're both dead. <laughs> Do you remember yeah. leapfrogging? What? Okay. <laughs> Leapfrog. 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 Right, so you're going to be good week, have a good picture show. Yes, thank you. Should we go in? Should we speak? Yeah, there's the museum, Abbey, Battlefield. Oh, that's a good idea. It should be good. Right, I'm glad you come along to the archaeology class today. So um, we'll be here until uh, 2 o'clock today. Uh, we've got tea and coffee break. I think you're staying for the other class. The new one I wanted to do this afternoon. No, I'm only joking. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I love it. That's really nice to speak to me. Yeah, I have Google there. Yeah, really. I guess it's going to be nice to have. Oh, she will. You will want to go in the shops if you can. Oh, I'm definitely going to go in the shops. Yeah, okie doke then. Probably, yes.
down. And I, I've told them that we're all going to be starting off on um, Saturday at 7 o'clock. Oh, no, Kathy's not going. It's, 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 it's Derek, Keith, Steve, and his daughter. Because we didn't, we didn't have anybody else really, because they all wanted to have a lift and stuff. And, and to be honest with you, you can't take too many people in Pete and uh, my car, can you? Is there, there are any small cars. Yeah. Pete's car's not big either. So how's work been? Dave back then? Uh -huh. Dave in today? Uh -huh. Dave, was Dave in today? Oh yeah, Dave's there. So any news from Kieran on them? No, it's very quiet. Oh, right. It's probably a woman. Uh -huh. It's probably a woman. So, oh God, I've no idea who that text was from last night. Oh wait, hang on a minute. Oh right, yeah, no, 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 I've no idea who it was. So, uh, yeah, I had a text off Natalie earlier on. She says, hi Carl, this is Natalie. I have left an envelope for you containing the book and joining the Atlantic Hall, and they have left it on your desk. My apologies for my absence today. So there you go. So she'll be back next week. So, um, yeah, it's interesting the way this is developing in Bridgend. So, uh... She came on a ghost walk with her, with her mum, yeah. So, so th that's fine. So, have you, have you, have you, um, have, have you got any food for the chickens later on? Sorry. Have you got any food for the chickens later on? Um, I didn't. I didn't use any. I didn't use any of the food from the bag. No. I, I used. I used what was in the container. Uh, oh, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, uh, just, just the stuff in the container I used, so. So, I, I, didn't, I didn't use everything. Oh, right, okay. I just, um, I just realised my, um, oh, no, that's fine. Hang on. Yeah, I've just, um, I just realised my, my battery's running low on my phone, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to phone up a second and I'm going to phone you back in a minute, okay? Alright, uh, you, you stay by your phone, I'll speak to you in a sec. I love you. Okay, bye. Bye, 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 bye. bye. Thank mm -hmm. you. 